Thanks to Nebula and CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. An extended version of this video is available right now on Nebula. Ah, Kyoto. Seat of the Japanese government for 11 centuries. Famous for its 2,000 temples and shrines, for its rock gardens, and for one of the most important, but flawed, international treaties of all time. In 1997, 193 countries signed the Kyoto Protocol, formally agreeing that scientific evidence indicated global warming was taking place due to human emission of greenhouse gases, and that we should do something to limit those emissions. This was hugely significant. It was the first time that countries agreed to do something about lowering greenhouse gas emissions. The protocol tried to be clever about how they did this. While recognising that more work was required in the future, it only required action from developed countries and required more action from the more polluting countries, though shared the load between all wealthy nations. One way that the Kyoto Protocol attempted to accomplish this was through the idea of emissions trading. This is pretty simple. Each country is given a certain number of carbon credits, with each credit allowing that country to emit one tonne of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, If a country wants to emit more carbon into the atmosphere than it has credits for, it can buy credits from other countries, which now can emit less carbon but have more money. This means that if a country wants to emit lots of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, they effectively have to pay a charge to do so, with that money going to countries which have a lower impact on the environment. So there's an incentive for countries to lower their emissions. Pretty clever. This was a market-based solution inspired by a similar one used to limit sulfur dioxide emissions in the USA, trying to combat acid rain, which it did very effectively. In fact, America made the inclusion of this emissions trading market a deal-breaker in the Kyoto Protocol, refusing to sign unless it was included. They got their way, and then of course refused to ratify the treaty, meaning that they didn't have to abide by the rule they insisted on for everyone else. To be more specific, there were three components to this trading. There was the basic emissions trading that I just described, but also the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, where rich countries would pay developing countries to undertake projects that would keep their emissions low, investing in renewable energy, things like that. There was also the Joint Implementation Scheme, where rich countries would collaborate together to jointly try and keep their emissions low. It sounds pretty comprehensive. Using the power of market forces to tackle climate change head on, covers all the eventualities. Rich countries, developing countries, collaboration. Climate change? Complete it, mate. However, it turned out this market approach was pretty flawed. It succeeded in bringing down emissions a bit, but not effectively. And, in fact, the markets created under the Kyoto Protocol didn't survive very long at all. The protocol came into force in 2008, and by 2012, the Clean Development Mechanism, the CDM, saw a complete market crash, as did the Joint Implementation Scheme. It turned out that there were a number of loopholes, exploits if you will, in these market trading mechanisms, and companies operating in countries that signed up to the Kyoto Protocol found these very quickly. Now, I don't know a lot about exploits. But I do happen to know someone who does. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Spiffing Brit, and today we're talking about some absolutely game-breaking exploits in, of course, everyone's favourite international treaty, the Kyoto Protocol. This is one of my favourite international treaties to absolutely break. And believe me, while the intention of the treaty was definitely to limit greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to talk about some extra spicy loopholes that basically reward the exact opposite behaviour. So get yourself a cup of tea, smash that subscribe button, and if you're feeling particularly majestic, you can even like Simon's video. Now, firstly, let's talk about the hydrofluorocarbons, or to you and me, HFCs. These are a happy family of chemicals mostly used to replace CFCs, another family of chemicals, don't worry, it's all sciencey, but I'm sure you're all smart enough to understand. Now, these chemicals are pretty unique because sadly they have an unfortunate side effect of destroying the ozone layer, which we actually need to survive. Now, HFC-23 is an extremely potent greenhouse gas, 
11,000 times more powerful than CO2. And of course, under the Kyoto Protocol, you can receive carbon credits for destroying it. So if you were to say artificially create the gas only to then destroy it, you can effectively farm infinite carbon credits. Very spicy. Now, how do you create HFC 23, you ask? Well, this is the best part because you can actually create it as a side product of producing HCFC22. What's that? Oh, nothing very interesting. It's another chemical that's a minor greenhouse gas, but it also destroys the ozone layer. So just to be clear, in one easy step, you can increase the market demand for HFC gases. And then of course, whilst trying to protect a dwindling ozone layer, and you can also get paid by international governments to destroy the side products, which happens to be a HFC gas as well. And guess what? Cheeky buggers did this all over the world. Oh, they are so cheeky. They do love destroying the environment. But seriously, did they not consult anyone about this? I mean, anyone can see that there's an exploit in this. You're rewarding people for producing greenhouse gases and then rewarding them for destroying it. They're going to create an infinite loop to make money. Come on, guys, it's not difficult. But that's just one example of an exploit. This next one is exceedingly spicy and it all uses nitrous oxide. This is another greenhouse gas, of course, 300 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. And under Kyoto, you can claim hundreds of carbon credits by eliminating one ton of nitrous oxide. Now, of course, hundreds of carbon credits. Now, I like the smell of all of that money. In South Korea, example, Rodia invested $15 million in equipment that destroys nitrous oxide, but that investment produced 1 billion in carbon credits. Now, that's far more than should have been possible. And how do they do this? How do they convert 15 million into 1 billion? Well, it's very simple. Firstly, Rodia received carbon credits for destroying the nitrous oxide. Great job, Gold Star. You're saving the planet, so take some money. However, Rodia is a company based in Europe, and Rodia is a company that voluntarily chose to destroy nitrous oxide and even spend money on equipment to do so. As such, because of a fantastic legal loophole, the carbon credits it received under the CDM fell outside of the EU emissions trading scheme. As far as the EU market was concerned, carbon credits were just appearing out of thin air into Rodia's account. And Rodia, of course, could do what all the other companies do and sell those carbon credits on the market. That meant Rodia was being paid to destroy nitrous oxide under the CDM and paid to sell its carbon credits on a different market in the EU. Now that is totally and utterly broken. It's effectively double counting any emissions reductions and then of course allowing the selling of carbon credits to other companies in the EU market. But these credits have come from literally nowhere. Companies buying them on in the EU market were doing so in order to of course offset their own emissions. Those emission reductions weren't real. It's like me buying a get out of jail free card from my friend for dumping oil in the sea whilst my friend owns an oil out of the sea pumping company which is located really really far away. Oh and guess what? They've got a lot of get out of jail free cards so I'm going to keep pouring oil into the ocean. So by doing this, Rodi was being paid to destroy emissions in Korea and then being paid again to allow emissions in Europe. It's absolutely crazy. I could go on and carbon trading is literally ridden with legal loopholes and just companies that are exploiting the ever-living hell out of it. And I know it sounds crazy, ladies and gentlemen, but it's almost like capitalism doesn't have the environment's best interests at heart. Oh dear. Instead, it has money at heart. And oh, I love money. And that's why I'm announcing that Spivco is setting up its own carbon neutral company where we're going to be pumping deadly nitrous oxide out of the environment and dumping it in France. That'll serve you right, Frenchies. Anyway, time to go. Clearly my exploit powers are too great to use here, so it's naturally back to making Simon cry and Civ again. And trust me, it's not difficult. Anyway, cheerio. Okay, maybe he's right. Quite apart from all of these exploits, and there are a lot of them. There is literally an entire Interpol document on the loopholes that companies found, and the colonial overtones of developed countries outsourcing the hard work to developing countries in a system that the developed countries designed themselves. And there are a lot of those too. The emissions trading scheme fell apart because it was never the right tool for this task. It had previously seen success in curbing sulfur dioxide emissions in the USA, limiting acid rain, but that's an entirely different kettle of fish to limiting carbon emissions. Generating sulfur dioxide is not a fundamental prerequisite for our modern standard of living, like generating carbon emissions is. Also, the scale of the problem is completely different. Acid rain is a serious problem, but climate change is potentially civilization ending. And this was raised at the negotiation table in Kyoto, with critics arguing that in this context, an emissions trading scheme was like abandoning climate change to 
the lore of the jungle. It was just too important to do that. But thanks to the insistence of American delegates at Kyoto, with America going on to never actually ratify the treaty, we ended up with a emissions trading scheme, a market-based solution. Because remember, capitalism solves everything. But the fact is that capitalist markets have one goal, maximize profits. That's it. And so companies will exploit any loopholes in a market to maximize their profits. It doesn't matter if the market was created for environmental reasons, if profits can be maximized at the expense of the environment, they will be. This was so widespread that one estimate states that only 2% of CDM projects had a high likelihood of actually reducing emissions. Many schemes ended up increasing carbon emissions overall through funneling money to extractive industries such as coal mining and even directly to coal-fired power plants if they just claimed their technology was the most efficient type. Which is a bit like giving out awards for best films and giving one to Transformers because it's the best in the Transformers series? But a flawed solution is still better than no solution at all, right? Well, yes, the Kyoto Protocol's emissions trading scheme did reduce greenhouse gas emissions a bit, but that's ignoring the fact that there were other better solutions that almost certainly would have resulted in a greater reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. If you want to implement a global climate solution that uses market forces to drive down carbon emissions, then Implement a carbon tax, a set price for every ton of carbon that's emitted such that products or services that take more carbon emissions to produce than others are more expensive, and the price of carbon gets higher every year. Over time, the products that take the least carbon to produce will be chosen by consumers and emissions will fall. That is a topic for a whole other video and does of course have its own problems, but in my opinion, and I think it would be safe to say the opinion of the majority of environmental economists, a carbon tax would have been far preferable to the emissions trading scheme implemented by the Kyoto Protocol. Thanks, America. The lesson here is that we still need to lower global greenhouse gas emissions, and doing so will require new solutions. Simply rehashing solutions from previous environmental problems isn't good enough. It won't work, because we've never faced an issue of this scale, of this complexity before. It can be done, but as we've seen, at least on a global scale, Carbon emissions trading is not the way to do this. That being said, there is one very significant carbon emissions market that has arguably been a success, the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme. Operational for the past 15 years, the EU ETS has been far more positively received by economists and environmentalists than the global market under the Kyoto Protocol. But why? Why is the EU ETS viewed differently? Well. I talk about this in a coda to this video over on Nebula. Both Spiff and myself are part of the large team of creators behind Nebula, a streaming service designed to be the expansion pack for the smart part of YouTube. How is it an expansion pack? Well, it features extra content, such as the extra part to this video, entirely exclusive content, such as my recent video on the carbon footprint of noted streaming site Hornpub, and Best of all, it's completely ad-free. You pay a small subscription fee and get to watch the part of YouTube that you already watch, but in higher quality, early, and with no adverts at all. But wait, there's more. We've partnered up with CuriosityStream, the home of the best documentaries on the internet, with a deal. If you sign up to CuriosityStream, say to watch Miniverse, Chris Hadfield driving across our solar system, scaled down to the continental United States with some guests, then you get access to Nebula for free. So how much does it cost to get access to not one, but two of the best streaming websites on the internet? $5 a month? Nope, just $14.79 a year. That's just over $1.20 a month. Frankly, this is far too good a deal to pass up on, so make sure that you go to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, linked in the description below, to sign up. Upgrade your viewing experience and directly support the educational content on this channel. Thank you to CuriosityStream and to Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope that you enjoyed it. I know that I certainly had a whale of a time working with my friend Spiff on a video. I don't think anyone's made this kind of content before. I'll be the first to admit that I am not an economist, I am an atmospheric dynamicist, so I hope you'll forgive me if I made any errors in this video. I tried my best to sum up the literature on the subject to a lay audience. That said, if you do have opinions on the video, please do let me know down there in the comments. I particularly welcome opinions from people who know a lot about environmental economics and 
could further this conversation. If you did enjoy the video, then please do pop it a like. You can subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more videos like this. And if you haven't heard of Spiff before, then um, yeah, check him out. He'll be one of the links up here, along with some other recommended viewing. If you haven't met him before, you're in for a wild ride. <laughs> Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.